are interviewing Miss Christine Wyatt. Uh, it is November the 12th, 2003 at the Atlanta History Center. Miss Wyatt, will you please introduce yourself and spell your name? I'm Christine Wyant. My last name is spelled W-E-Y-A-N-D-T. And could you please tell me where you were born and the date of your birth? I was born in Neelyton, Pennsylvania on March the 21st, 1921. Thank you very much and thank you for coming today to share your World War II story with us. Um, could you begin please by telling me about growing up in Pennsylvania and how you came to be a part of the war effort? Well, um, I led a very uneventful life, well, and a happy life. I had a good childhood. Uh, even going through the Depression, I wasn't too aware of what, you know, what was being deprived of, of anyone. But December the 7th, 1941 changed everything. Um, my friends were leaving for different branches of service and there were all kinds of changes made in uh, the food we could buy, clothing we could buy. How old were you at that time? I was uh, uh, tw uh, 20 when uh, it things started changing and, but there was all that turmoil in Europe before Do the Japanese remember struck December 7th specifically and when you heard the news oh yes could you tell me a little about that please um, we were very excited because uh, my parents' first grandchild was born that morning. We heard that Eric had arrived, and uh, we had just got home from church, and my dad turned on the radio, and we found out that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. We knew there were islands called the Hawaiian Islands, but Pearl Harbor didn't mean anything to us, but things heated up real fast. And uh, then we, uh, everyone pitched in. There was a lot of unity. Uh, everyone wanted to do something. The Red Cross offered courses, and we. Uh, did everything we could to volunteer. Uh, there was ration, rationing and then recycling. What do you recall being rationed? Oh, sugar, coffee. Uh, uh, you were lucky to get a pair of silk stockings. That was before we had the nylons. And uh, meat was scarce. You had to make sure you knew the butcher to be there on a specific time to get meat. And uh, offhand, that's all I can think of right now. But later, more things became hard to get. And did you know friends of yours that were going into the service? Oh, yes, them? yes. And those who were in college were uh, enlisting in uh, with the understanding that they would be able to uh, finish, if not their uh, degree, at, at least the year or semester that they were in. So uh, most of my friends were hit, and then when the draft came along, uh, and my kid brother was. 18, and he hadn't finished high school, and my mother fretted a lot. Was he drafted? Uh, yes, he was. What was his name? Darrell. Darrell Moore? Darrell Moore. And uh, he uh, 
but I wanted to get into service before he did. And the only uh, service that was open to women originally was the Army. And I wasn't so sure about the Army, but then when the Navy accepted women, I wanted to get in the Navy. And uh, after a lot of effort, uh, I had my physical examination done it by my family doctor and sent my application in to the recruiter and they refused me because I weighed uh, about 104 pounds and uh, they said I had to weigh at least 110 and after that refusal, refusal I tried to do everything to gain weight and, uh, when was this that you had applied to the waves? In 1942. And uh, I, I w anyone would tell me something that would put weight on me, I'd try it. And one thing was to take whole cream and mix it with um, uh, ginger ale. And I hit those pretty hard for a while, and all I did was end up by upsetting my stomach and uh, lost what weight I had gained. But then I took it gradually, and I got my weight up, I guess, to 109. And I wrote to the recruiter in Pittsburgh, and I gave him my story that I tried, but I couldn't gain weight, but I was you know, healthy, and I wanted to go into the waves. So... Did you know anybody who had gone into the waves? No. Some friends that were no. As well? There were some that were in the uh, wax, but uh, that was the Army, women in the Army. But uh, there were no waves, and uh, I guess they were either hard up for recruits or they felt sorry for me. And they called me in for an examination. Was this in your hometown? No, Pittsburgh. I had to, my parents took me and um, I went to, uh, uh, met up with my sister and she went with me over to Pittsburgh. And uh, when they, after they sent me back through the line, you know, uh, doctors, every which every kind, were checking you out and prodding you and poking. And uh, I got to the end of the line, and um, I went into this office, and the doctor looked at my record, and he said, "Well, you're healthy. That's good, but you're underweight." And I went on with the sob story that I tried and I just can't gain weight. And he said, well, let me see your legs. I hesitated and he said, stand up, stand up on your, on your toes. So I stood up on my toes he, and he pulled my robe back, I was wearing one that reached the floor, and he felt my leg up and down and he said <laughs> good and uh, that made me feel good because he smiled and uh, he wrote down I found that later because I went back and looked at the record uh, a strong and wiry so I got into the Navy on my legs I, I tell everybody that anyway. <laughs> and um, then uh, I was accepted and then did I was... Did they send you an acceptance letter or did they tell you Well, they told me there. there. He told me there. And uh, then I was called. I went home and they called me uh, and um, told me that I would be reporting to uh, Hunter College in Bronx, New York. And uh, they swore me in as an apprentice seaman. And uh, 
I got on a train with a whole lot of other girls. Anybody knew? No, didn't know of one. Were you nervous? And uh, no, just excited. And uh, well, I may be nervous too. You know, it was all going into the unknown. And uh, we arrived in New York, and uh, we went up to Hunter College and went into this big armory. And uh, do you remember the name of the armory? No, it was right. Uh, I, I, it was either on the campus or right adjacent to it. And uh, they gave us waves caps, the hats. And we were told that we would wear those at all times because they wanted us to learn to salute all our superiors. And then we were taken to uh, our, the apartment house. And I was put in an apartment, a two-room apartment with eight girls and one bathroom. And uh, that was interesting. Tell and, me more about that. Well, we got along pretty well. Some girls took too long to shower, you know, but uh, uh, it was okay. And I did real well because uh, I could put up my hair when I'd get in, in bed at night, and I didn't use a mirror. I just grew up the pin curls. And um, some girls had to, you know, stand in front of the mirror and primp, and you know that, the way they are. But uh, it was uh, it was real interesting, and we we didn't have any fights or anything. And then after we were issued uniforms, uh, well, the uh, first part of the uniform were those cotton lisle stockings and uh, heavy oxfords that had to be tied up black. So we, our uniform consisted of our hats and those hose and the uh, Oxfords. And uh, we had to do our own wash in our rooms. And uh, I was real lucky because I had taken a, uh, an iron with me. And I, I had the only iron in the apartment. So Anything that needed ironed of mine, someone would do it because I wasn't very fast. And uh, they would do my ironing so they could use my iron. And uh, we had classes during the day. We were learning about the Navy. And uh, then uh, we had extra duty, too. Uh, we had to have roving patrol at night, which um, two of us would walk around on the different floors of the apartment building to see that everything was quiet and everyone was snuggled in their bed. I think uh, each of us would take a turn of one hour. And I also had duty in the uh, ship's store. And while I was there on duty one day, I guess it was the second day I was on duty. A man from public relations came through, and he looked at me, and he asked some questions. And then the next thing I knew, I had a report to, uh, I was to report to public relations for extra duty. It really wasn't extra duty. It was getting me out of class and drill, and, uh, and they. Oh, we had to learn to march, you know, all military uh, rules. And uh, there were uh, uh, Marine sergeants that did some of the uh, instructing. And then there were chief petty officers who uh, were the drill instructors. And they were called the Gene Tunney boys, Gene Tunney was a, uh, a heavyweight boxing champion. And he was in charge of 
of these men that came in to get them in shape to for instructing. And uh, so those chief petty officers were pretty good. Um, once in a while their language would slip and there was one girl in our platoon who was called a sack of potatoes a number of times because she would be slow in making her a bad face. And, um, Do you remember her name? I shouldn't say it. No, I'm not going to say it. Francis Swan. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, it was fun. But uh, then... Um, so when you went to the PR office, you reported to the PR office, what happened then? Well, they took me out on uh, um, publicity shoots. Uh, one time we went to uh, Bronx Zoo and uh, I don't know what this was going to do to get women into the Navy, but uh, they had me ride a camel, and I was scared to death. At least I looked scared to death when I saw one of the pictures later. And then another day they took me, uh, I think there was one other girl at that time, uh, to Central Park, to one of the lakes, and they had a sailor there who rode a boat with me in it. And then another time uh, we went down to the battery and then got on a boat over to the uh, Statue of Liberty. And I saw one of the pictures that was taken that day. Um, they had two of us perch on a, the rail of the boat with the Statue of Liberty in the background. And that was called Cheesecake Shot. And um, the, that, that was the only pictures other than, you know, just along the way. So uh, then when we, um, well, our drilling, we even had a captain's review, you know, we paraded. Uh, that was exciting. That's after we got our uniforms, good old cotton uniforms. And uh, we'd learn how to tie our ties, and we looked real sharp. And uh, when our training was over, um, I was given the uh, rating of uh, a third class yeoman uh, and uh, a number of the girls were still apprentice seamen and they were sent to school to learn something else but they knew they needed me you know I was so essential <laughs> and uh, what were the responsibilities of a third class yeoman? Uh, it was I, I had been a secretary and a bookkeeper and uh, uh, had finished secretarial college and they just knew, you know, they didn't have to train me further and they needed people. And because they were, uh, we were replacing sailors, men, and uh, uh, they, in one of the interviews, they asked me where I wanted to go, and I said, oh, any place but Washington, D.C. So they sent me to Washington, D.C., to the Bureau of Naval Personnel. When was that? Uh, it was in uh, July of 43, and uh, when I got to Washington, was they Oh no, they had taken us by troop train. I'd never been on a troop train from uh, New York to Washington. What was that like? What is a troop train? Um, well, it, it, it was a number of uh, coaches and there were men on some of them, but they kept the women together. But, uh, and when we got to Washington, we were taken to the uh, 
um, uh, Anacostia Naval Base and uh, taken into the barracks there and I thought, oh my, I hope I don't have to live here. The food was terrible. It was all cooked by men and um, uh, well, I, I had an appreciation for what the men had to put up with. But that was just overnight. And then the next day they took us, uh, or the ones that were assigned to uh, uh, the uh, Navy Department there, uh, took us to what was called Arlington Farms, which was a, uh, uh, they had a number of residence halls that were uh, used for government women. And uh, my duty assignment was going to be uh, the notification section of the Bureau of Naval Personnel in the Navy Annex. And uh, the, uh, that was not what I expected to do. What did you expect to be doing? Well, I thought something exciting and fun, but in the notification section of casualties, we received the casualty reports, the missing in action, the killed in action, the wounded, and it was our job to receive those messages and uh, take the man's service record, find out who his next of kin was to be notified, and we were the ones who would send out the letter, the Navy Department or the Secretary of Navy regrets to inform you your son so-and-so was killed in action. And uh, the war became very real to me then because these were people with families, loved ones that were going to miss them. And if they were missing in action, they would worry about them because I knew what my mother was like. And um, so it was real hard for me for a while to get to the place that I could really do the job I thought efficiently. Well, I won't say that efficient. I think I was efficient all the time because I took it very seriously. But it was um, it was very hard for a while. And uh, tell me about a typical day. Well, I get up in the morning and maybe go to the. Uh, um, mess hall. Well, we didn't have a mess hall then to the cafeteria and get something to eat or drink, which wasn't very often because I didn't like to eat in the morning. I'd wait until we had a break time to go and have something to eat. Uh, but you get dressed in uniform and uh, sometimes if the weather was bad, uh, I would take a bus and back then, it was a 10 cents or a token. Uh, you could get three tokens for a quarter. Uh, take the bus to work. And if, it, if I had the afternoon shift, sometimes I would walk with friends through Arlington National Cemetery, which was a cut through to get to the Bureau of Naval Personnel. And um, then at different times, well, I started out, I had to make cards that were records of, of the casualties because we had, uh, we didn't have computers back then. We had card files of the people who were casualties and uh, then folders of, say, any ship or uh, a 
battle that had a number of, of ships with casualties uh, in, in a separate room. And that was classified. And uh, when I was, uh, everyone who handled classified documents had to have a, an FBI background check. And uh, when the FBI checked on me, they, of course they had to go back to the small town and question everyone. Voices were uh, supposing this and that about me, and they didn't know what was going on with Christine Moore because the FBI was there checking on her. But anyway, it was because I handled classified documents. Uh, uh, I, after uh, a while, I was put in a position where the uh, documents were received and uh, they were coded and uh, a list was made of the names and then the service records had to be pulled from our record center there in the same uh, building in a different wing where I worked. And uh, they were distributed to the different uh, typists or other yeomen in the area. And uh, just get it out. And Notification had to go out. Was as, there a set form to the letter, or did you? Oh have yes, to read they were. They were. They were form letters. That's it. Uh, it was. We regret to inform you. We re regret to inform you. And all the typist did was fill in the, uh, the address, and if it was your son, and give the name and rank or rate, and uh, give what happened, uh, which was very minimal information because uh, we we didn't have the information then, but later on, uh, sometimes like if a, a ship were sunk or had a lot of of casualties, the senior surviving officer would come in, and uh, uh, he would give additional information. That uh, and then letters were sent from the correspondence section to. Uh, give the uh, next of kin more information, whether prisoner of war or whatever we found out. But that went into another, uh, it was in the casualty section, but that was a correspondence section. And, uh, but, you know, one letter would be made up and it would be used for a number of people. Did you ever, in your time working in the notifications department, encounter a name of someone that you knew, or did this occur with any of your friends? It happened uh, once, and um, the girl who received the list, here was her brother's name and his service record, and it was terrible. She um, Do you was, that yes. She was Dickie Cook. No, uh, she wasn't Dickie Cook. She was, Cook was her last name. They called her Cookie. That's the reason I said Dickie. Uh, her name, last name was Cook. But anyway, it was her brother. And it was horrible for everybody who knew her. I didn't know her brother, but they, um, the brass got on the ball then, and uh, any had anyone that worked in casualties to give the name and the uh, service number of anyone they had that was in service, you know, that a f close friend or relative. And then they put that information in the man's service record so that it could be seen before it got to any individual, and uh, it was so good that they flagged them, but it was a little bit late, uh, and uh, <coughs> then uh, 
it was a, as I told you, that we replaced men. And I guess some men resented the women coming in and taking their jobs, but I never had that. The men that I worked with were always kind and uh, uh, considerate and, you know, were anxious to teach me all that they could. and. Uh, so I never ran across that. I just, it's one of those things you hear about. And what was the sort of spirit or feeling in Washington at that time? Well, everyone was doing their job and wanting, uh, to do whatever they could. There was no, um, there wasn't resentment. Everyone seemed to be pulling together. There was a, a unity everywhere. And, uh, but it was a busy place and uh, lots of service people. Uh, Washington, I guess, was a good uh, leave or uh, what do the Army call it? It's leave for the Navy. Uh, the fellas from Quantico and uh, what other places? The uh, Anacostia Naval Base and there was Bowling Field which was the uh, Air Force, Army Air Corps. But uh, it was filled with military people. Did you all have a chance to interact socially? Well, we could if we wanted to, but I had my own friends that I was busy writing letters or um, if they would go through town, I'd meet them. And uh, with, with the women that I uh, shared time with, we mostly had someone who meant a lot to us or maybe some ones, it may, may not just be one, because we, uh, you know, try to keep them all happy. <laughs> that isn't nice. But, you know, we had lots of friends. Uh, I had a, a brother in the Air Force and a brother-in-law in the Navy, and I had uh, a couple friends in the Air Force, and. The man that I married was in the Marines, and uh, so I, I didn't um, really, I, I did go to some dances that they had, you know, at certain places that, uh, there was one at Georgetown, once I remember, and uh, where was the other one that I remember doing, going to? I didn't enjoy it because I, you know, I didn't know the fellas. That wasn't my cup of tea. We would sometimes go up and rent a canoe and canoe in the Potomac or get bicycles out on Haynes Point and, uh, What else do we do? Uh, uh, go down to Mount Vernon, and uh, so. Uh, you mentioned having some girlfriends that you spend a good amount of time with. Um, would you care to tell me their names? Well, um, Eileen Pierce. I guess I was with her longer than anybody. But then Eileen was one of the early waves who volunteered for service overseas. And she went to uh, Hawaii. And she had a great time in Hawaii. She was attached to Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet, SYNCPAC. And uh, uh, she, uh, she was a, from a Swede from Minnesota, and she was so funny. She would uh, 
use this Swedish accent. And uh, <laughs> can I tell a dumb joke? She said <laughs> once the uh, the girl was at a dance and she was asked by a fella to dance and she said, "No, I don't think so." When I dance, I sweat so. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> but <laughs> Eileen could really use the Swedish accent. And, uh, but, uh, and are you still in touch with Ms. Pierce? Uh, Christmas time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, um, let's see what else. Oh, there were, I had my first um, migraine headache when the Indianapolis was sunk. That was at the, toward the end of the war, and um, there were over 900 men lost. And uh, the Japanese had surrendered. We'd already dropped the two atom bombs. And uh, we had to get that notification out to the next of kin before it got on um, radio or in the newspapers. And, uh, and so why we. Why did they not know about the Indianapolis at that time? Well, uh, it was out in the Pacific, and anything that happened that uh, uh, any. Uh, Any time the uh, enemy uh, did anything, it was a while before the information was given to the public, because that's one reason why handling classified information, you had to, uh, they had to check your background, because you know there was the, um, you don't know, but the sign, the, uh, uh, it would show Uncle Sam with his finger up to not uh, talk. Um, they didn't want any loose talk in public places. And, of course, when uh, a ship the size of the Indianapolis was sunk with that many people, How many people? there was nine, over 900. And um, it they had to get the notification out to the next of kin before it got publicized and uh, and before the uh, end of the war was made public. So we worked around the clock. Uh, up until that time, we had two shifts and we would go to work uh, daytime from 8 to 4 one week and the next week it would be 4 till 12. Just every other week you were on a night shift. But uh, that we worked around the clock as much as we could and uh, to get that notification out. And then after uh, the Japanese surrendered, uh, there were all of these uh, cases that were listed, men missing in action, and something had to be done about changing the status of those. And there was uh, um, one of the officers that I had worked with in notification was sent in there w to help make determinations on these people who were missing in action to review the cases, get all the information they could, uh, last, the muster rolls of the last sailing and that because there were a lot of submarines that were, uh, the crews would be listed as missing in action because they were overdue. You know, they had left one port and they were due at another port and they were overdue. So when after a certain length of time, if they were overdue, they had to uh, 
come to the conclusion that they were missing. So uh, these, um, they were mostly lawyers in this group, would get all the information they could together and then they could make a determination to change that person's status from missing in action. Maybe they had been on the missing in action list uh, three years or, and uh, uh, they would change them to uh, presumed dead uh, because, you know, of their, their uh, I don't know how it was uh, a law uh, some way that uh, the Secretary of the Navy could, they could make a determination. But uh, everything, all the evidence that we had would be checked. And, uh, but we did have one man, uh, his name was George Tweed, I think it was, who had been on the island of Guam when the Japanese uh, took possession. And that man stayed on Guam until the uh, United States went in and drove the Japanese out. And he, uh, he's the only one I know that was missing and uh, he came back. How long did you stay in Washington with Wade? Well, um, I was ready. My husband came. He wasn't my husband then, but he came back in October of uh, 45. But what is your husband's name, please? Thomas Wyant. And uh, I wasn't, I didn't, wouldn't have enough points until February. What sort of points? Well, you had to have been in service so many months. Uh, uh, I can count the months up, but I forget what the service, the number of points was required. And, um, but and you had about to the, earn points to have leave? N no, to be discharged. I wanted to get home because he was already out of the Marines. So he was back in Pennsylvania. Uh huh. Okay. And uh, we, uh, I came down with acute infectious mononucleosis. And uh, I, I guess there weren't too many cases uh, diagnosed at that time because they sent me to Bethesda Naval Hospital. And that was another experience. They kept me there uh, four weeks. But while I was there, I began to see some of these men who had been wounded in action. And I saw how well they were cared for. That you would see men, you knew that they had suffered from burns because of their, you know, the color of their skin. And uh, there, I'm sure there was an awful lot of reconstruction of faces and uh, limbs. Uh, so that was something else that was, um, it was hard to see, but I was glad that we had the, as much care as was available to give to these men because I'm sure they, they suffered then and they suffer for years to come. And, uh, but then... Uh, and when you got better from mono? Um, I, I was discharged. You were discharged. Mm -hmm. And you were happy? Oh, yes. I got married within a month. <laughs> been a, it's, and she's been happy ever after. And your husband, when he was on the Marines, where where was he serving? He was in the Pacific all the time. He, uh, New Zealand, uh, and Bougainville, and his last uh, station was Okinawa, 
they were getting ready to go into Japan when the uh, bombs were dropped and uh, so the war was over. But they kept him longer than he wanted to stay, but uh, I guess they needed him. Washington, D.C., did you all have an opportunity to communicate by letters or by telephone oh, uh, with your family or with your husband? Uh, oh, I, I could, my family, uh, because we were all here in the States, but uh, uh, the man I married, it was only by letters, and uh, it took quite a while for a letter Weeks. to, Days. oh, longer than that sometimes. and. Um, uh, we had what they called V-mail uh, that was, um, I don't know what process it went through, but they were photographed and they could send more letters out like that. And then we had our own franking period, uh, privilege. All we needed to do was write free on the envelope and we didn't have to put a stamp on it. Is that available to all service members? Uh-huh. Uh, but when I send anything overseas, I always put a, an airmail stamp on it. Well, no, I didn't always, because sometimes I'd be short of cash. We weren't paid too much. How did the pay work as a wave? Were you paid on a monthly basis? Yes, or? yes. And according to your? Uh, according to your, your rank or rate. And, uh, uh, we had a food allowance up until the time we had our own mess hall. And uh, when we had our mess hall, then we had to use the, we didn't get the food allowance. And then we had a small clothing allowance. If you'd look at that, uh, uh, one of those uh, that showed the uh, clothing that was issued to me at Hunter, uh, I think I got uh, about six shirts and two uniforms, and uh, and it all uh, amounted to I I, I got a uh, raincoat with a, a zip in lining. I think it all came up to about a hundred and seventeen dollars. Um, would you like to show us some of the items that you bought and tell me a little bit about them? Well, please. Um, uh, this was recruiting information to tell about um, the waves, and of course the spars were the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was my Bureau, purse, Bureau of Naval Personnel identification. Uh, any of the um, uh, government buildings were guarded. Uh, and you had to show your identification before you got in. Uh, we at uh, the Navy Annex where I worked, uh, our guards were Marines. And the uh, Marine headquarters was in the same building that I worked. And uh, uh, the Marine Commandant's office was there. But anyway, you showed this, and of course this would get me into a lot of places. We would once in a while go to the, um, down to the Pentagon to see if we could get different food than what the Navy was giving us. And uh, I don't think this is any, oh, this is uh, my husband. And this was when he was, uh, I think this was Bougainville. This was his tent. They dug the foxhole and um, had their tent down in it. And uh, he informed me that this was back there where you see the naked man standing was a shower. And uh, 
And what else did he tell me about it? It was. Do you know approximately what year that might have been taken? That was probably 44. And um, he, he told me stories about how the, um, that when they were on Okinawa and the typhoons, that uh, he, he was a battery commander. And he got the message to uh, tie down everything. And he said by then, the tents were blowing away, and uh, they had several pretty bad typhoons. Uh, All of my clothes that were issued that first time came to $120.20. Uh, uh, cotton suit, a raincoat with a lining, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, ten. I guess there are ten. Uh, Ten shirts in that, and I had two different ties. You had a black tie and a blue tie. You, Were they for separate occasions? And no, with different shirts. We had a a uh, reserve blue shirt, which uh, uh, took a black tie. Or no, the blue tie, the light blue went with that, and then the black tie went with the white. Uh, shirts. And you are sharing your uniforms, is that correct? Which yes. To yes. For their exhibition. Yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, any other details that you would like to share? I can't think of anything. Do you have some questions? Um, you did a great job. Thank mm -hmm. you very much for okay. your interview, Ms. Wyatt. Okay.